In the last four years, there has been lots of progress in the various areas of medical research that I have highlighted since the year 2000 as necessary for combating aging. But the great news is that all of these advances have been pretty much what I would have expected and predicted back then. We have not had to redesign the overall strategy for defeating aging really at all in the past decade. So this is very good news. It shows that the general approach that we have been pursuing is standing the test of time. When I identify and my colleagues in Sense Research Foundation identify a project that we feel needs to be worked on in order to defeat aging, the first thing that we do is we have conversations with the world's leading scientists, the people who are most equipped to work on that specific problem. And sometimes those scientists are not immediately aware that their expertise could be used in this way. But these conversations are always very fulfilling and efficient because it is always easy to explain to a scientist why their expertise and their work has an application that they had not previously considered. And of course, very often they can come back to us and give us new ideas to improve the particular experimental design that we have come up with. So in general, it is very easy to get the best people to work on the most important experiments as soon as we have the funding to support those experiments. We have a long-term plan and, of course, also a medium-term plan and a short-term plan for our research. The medium-term milestone that we want to achieve, which we think we can very probably achieve within eight or ten years, is to take mice, which would normally live maybe three years, and do nothing at all to them until they are already two years old, with one year of life to go and then apply a combination of treatments to those mice which rejuvenate them well enough that they will live actually another three years until a total longevity of five years old. That milestone, which I call robust mouse rejuvenation, is something that will really completely demonstrate that in due course, maybe after another 10 or 20 years, we will be able to do the same thing or more for human beings. So that is the milestone that we are really aiming towards. But of course in the shorter term we break that down into many different specific scientific problems and we are making progress on each of those at different rates. One of the biggest differences between the future of longevity research and clinical practice of longevity medicine as opposed to how it has been in the past, is that in the past our progress has been slow and gradual and relatively smooth. For the past 150 years, longevity in the richest nations in the world has been going up by about the same rate, about two or two and a half years per decade. And we think that, that may continue, though actually over the next 10 or 20 years, I think there is a good chance that it may slow down. But when the therapies that we are working on here at Sense Research Foundation come along, everything's going to be very different. Because these therapies are rejuvenation therapies, which do not simply slow aging down, they actually repair the underlying damage of aging and essentially reverse it, taking people back to a genuinely younger biological age. When we can do that, the impact on longevity will be very much bigger. And in fact, even relatively incomplete, imperfect treatments will be enough to give people an indefinite lifespan. So it will be a very sudden change in contrast to what we have seen in the past. Out of the many different things that we need to fix in order to defeat aging, some are a lot closer to clinical application than others. In particular, one whole area of great importance for rejuvenation technology is stem cell therapy, 
which, of course, is a very big field being worked on all over the world by many researchers. And much of that research is specifically targeted towards the diseases and disabilities of old age. For that reason, Sense Research Foundation actually doesn't do very much stem cell research. We don't fund very much in that area. We think that we would not make so much of a difference with our small budget of only $5 million or so per year. We tend to work on the much more difficult problems that are at an earlier stage of development. But still, there are some problems we work on which are kind of halfway between the two and are quite close to the clinic. For example, the approach that we are taking to repair and reverse cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, by eliminating the molecules that cause white blood cells to become toxic. That approach is already showing proof of concept. We published a very important paper on this just last year. And we believe that within as little as five years, we could even be able to begin clinical trials of this approach, introducing new enzymes from bacteria that can break down these toxic molecules. A world in which aging is no longer the main cause of death will certainly be a very different world. Today, in today's world, in the West, roughly 90% of deaths are caused by aging in one way or another. So, of course, that means that when aging is brought under medical control, people will generally live a lot longer on average. And, of course, what they die of will be unrelated to how old they are. There will still be car accidents, there will still be infections and so on, but life will certainly be very different. The social effects are enormous. We will certainly have an opportunity to restructure the career of people so that they can work less time or work and then retire and then go back to work and so on. People will probably have more multiple partners over time, uh, people will not have to spend their middle age looking after their elderly parents because their elderly parents won't need looking after anymore. Many, many changes will happen. I think it is important to try to forward plan, to try to predict some of these changes. But what's very, very important is if we see a change that may be difficult to accommodate, a problem that might be created by the defeat of aging, we must not let that intimidate us and make us slow down in our efforts to defeat aging. Because the fact is, aging doesn't just kill people. It causes an astronomical amount of suffering. And just as with anything else that causes suffering, we have an absolutely clear moral obligation to do our best to eliminate it. At the moment, Sense Research Foundation spends roughly $5 million each year supporting research, both in our facility here in California and also in university laboratories around the world. We are desperately underfunded, really. We could certainly spend ten times more than that before we ran out of things that are really important to support. And the worst thing is that if we look at where other funding bodies are putting their money, hardly any of it is going into this critical area of research the elimination of aging as a medical problem. Probably only 10 or 20 million dollars around the world, from, uh, from governments even, is going into this area. So we are probably the single biggest funder. We even with our tiny budget of 5 million dollars. It's got to change and that's why I spend so much of my time doing interviews like this and doing public speaking and so on in order to educate the world that now is the time to invest properly in research that will hasten the defeat of aging and alleviate an amazing amount of suffering. But seriously, we actually have been doing some really great uh, progress with the sea circle and ice and stuff. Brilliant. Okay, what's the next? So, Dave and I were. Dave and I were actually doing the testing, mm -hmm. uh, comparing the, the valve blood assay, the regular assay yep, from yep. the mm -hmm. and then the new one, so we're trying to do, so we're doing parallel experiments. Oh, I see, yeah, good. 
with the exact same sample. So we prepare the samples, and then everything done in the same day, we separate, we split them up, and then I do with the Elias, like he does it with the dump line. Yeah, right. And so we're able to calculate some uh, sensitivity slopes for linear response. And then what we found is that the when we tested it, it was like a, a week or two ago, the double assay was actually about four times more sensitive. So we actually had the actual number to sort of the goal to beat. Yeah, yeah. And then I did more experiments just by myself, just trying to increase the slope um, to levels near that. Mm -hmm. And I think I was able to do that. So now we're gonna next week we're gonna do a parallel experiment okay, again, again right, yeah. to see if that fixes it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So because when you got the lab meeting, which was only two weeks ago, you were about to return after. Right? Well, that's what that was your estimate. Yeah, that was my accident, so, so it was actually much better than yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was like, well, that was that's great. Yeah. in order to make me take part, but yeah, it was actually much better, and so we try, so next week we're going to have answers for that before yeah. Christmas break. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm trying to have the answer by the end of Wednesday, because I'm not going to have that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> well, you'll you get a, probably get a happy email if things work. Which is what I like to hear. Yeah, sure. Okay.